Cool. So welcome to lecture 17 uh, of digital design and computer architecture. We're uh, almost uh, more than two thirds of the semester over and we've covered a lot of exciting topics. Uh, we're going to cover even more uh, starting today. Uh, this will first start with we'll first start with data flow and uh, superscalar execution. And you data flow, you probably remember. Uh, this is going to be mostly review, but it's a timely review because we've already seen how out of order execution processors work. And this is going to be more of a reminder of why out of order execution is so successful underneath and why data flow has not been as successful. Uh, but the concepts are conceptually essentially the same. Underneath, we're executing things, uh, instructions in a data flow out order in an out of order execution processor. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, uh, there, uh, these are the required readings. So this has been, uh, this is no news. I think this, you, you've been seeing this, you've, you've seen this many times before. Uh, we're, we've been covering this microarchitecture of superscalar processors in many different lectures. And Harris and Harris has some treatment, as you know. Uh, and McFarling's uh, combining branch predictors tutorial, let's say, and also a research paper, we'll cover it in lecture 17b and probably into lecture 18 next week as well. Okay, uh, remember we've covered all of these different microarchitecture paradigms and we've improved the performance of a system significantly. Uh, and finally, we ended up with out of order execution. Yesterday, uh, we had a review of out of order execution in the beginning. You didn't have to watch that part. And later, we actually uh, went into more detail on how out of order execution operates and how load store engine works. As I mentioned in the lecture, you're not going to be responsible for how load store uh, unit operates in exams, et cetera, but it's important to know uh, for, for, for really understanding how an out-of-order engine operates. It's, uh, it's really important to cover uh, that. In, in many uh, uh, classes, I think people cover uh, adds, multiplies, et cetera, to show how out-of-order execution operates, but uh, without covering loads and stores, I think you don't do a full treatment of how that engine works. And we will cover loads and stores more uh, going into the future, actually, uh, in these lectures, as you will see. Now let's jump into other execution paradigms, briefly at least, before we cover control dependence prediction, which is branch prediction. And then we will go back to other execution paradigms. And we're going to cover a lot of other execution paradigms. In fact, we've been covering them. Clearly, pipelining is actually an execution paradigm, meaning it's an approach to how to get more concurrency out of your machine. Uh, and this is instruction level concurrency. And fine grain multi threading is another execution paradigm, actually, we will see again in GPUs. We covered it as a way of avoiding control and data dependencies, as you know. And it's going to be a, another way of, uh, we will discuss briefly today. But it's also an execution paradigm because it enables multi threaded execution at a very fine grain level. And it's, it's also an approach to instruction level concurrency. You'd execute different instructions in your pipeline, except those instructions happen to be from different threads, right? And we've covered out over execution. And we, today we're going to cover a little bit more on data flow at the ISA level. It's going to be mostly review of data flow, but hopefully with a different perspective, uh, as I mentioned. And then we're going to cover data superscalar execution, which is important to cover because it's very tightly tied together uh, with improving performance in a machine you, that uses out of order execution in general, even though they're completely orthogonal concepts. Uh, and then we're going to move into branch prediction. And later on, we're going to cover the remaining execution paradigms, which are quite exciting. As you can see, VLIW, SIMD processing, vector and array processors, GPUs are examples of SIMD processing, decoupled access execute, and systolic arrays. And all of these ideas are employed in different parts of the computing domain today. So for example, GPUs employ SIMD processing for sure, VLIW, they employ VLIW, they employ fine-grained multi-threading, they employ pipelining. So one processor can actually employ many of these different uh, approaches to concurrency to maximize performance and efficiency. And clearly systolic arrays, as we mentioned earlier, at the high level is employed in uh, many uh, machine learning accelerators today. So we're gonna talk about the principles of systolic arrays uh, in a later lecture, not this week for sure. Okay, so let's review data flow uh, with the new understanding we got from out of order execution uh, last week and yesterday. And remember, data flow was all about exploiting irregular parallelism. If parallelism is not easy to find in your program, let's say by a compiler, scheduling instructions is not easy uh, then by a compiler, as we discussed in an earlier lecture. Uh, but uh, hardware can easily find and schedule those instructions 
automatically, if you will, in a very irregular manner. Dependencies might occur at different points in the program. And if you have a large enough data flow engine or large enough window in an out-of-order execution processor, then you'll be able to capture and fi find uh, and capture those independent instructions and execute them concurrently while some other instructions are waiting for their dependencies to be resolved. And essentially, this, is, this could be completely irregular. There could be no predictability to the, reg, uh, to the parallelism in this particular case. And data flow, this is where data flow paradigm really shines at. If you cannot uncover parallelism in a regular way, uh, data flow can come to your rescue because it really identifies parallel instructions where parallelism is really uh, not findable in some other way in, 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 in regular, using regular methods. And remember, uh, this was a slide from yesterday, actually, out of order execution is a restricted data flow uh, paradigm, let's say. An out of order engine dynamically builds a data flow graph of a piece of the program. And that piece, that data flow graph that uh, the out of order execution engine builds and executes is limited to the instruction window. We defined this also in uh, previous lectures. Instruction window is really all decoded, but not yet retired instructions. And by looking at the instruction window and the reservation stations, uh, and reorder buffer as well, and the register file, of course, as, as, we, do, as we have done, you can basically reconstruct uh, the program, mostly. Uh, you may not be able to perfectly reconstruct the exact order, sequential order of instructions, because remember, this is data flow graph. Data flow graph doesn't, by nature, have sequential ordering, as we have discussed earlier, and as we, I'm going to put, uh, again, a reminder slide of. Uh, basically, you can reconstruct, you can reverse engineer uh, the data flow graph of a machine. And if you're lucky, you can also reverse engineer the sequential order of instructions with some other hints that you may have in other parts of the machine. Right? So this is very powerful. And this essentially, the fact that you can reconstruct the data flow graph uh, of a program shows that uh, the out of order engine is essentially a restricted data flow machine. Uh, okay, then we also discussed two questions, which I'm not going to go into because this, this actually has uh, generated a lot of research. Can we somehow do it for the whole program? Can we actually uh, construct uh, the uh, data flow graph and essentially have large reservation stations, large instruction window, large physical register files, etc.? cetera? Uh, certainly you can potentially, but then you're limited by the complexity and the power and the energy uh, consumed by all of those uh, buses and structures that we have built in the last lecture, right? The tag matching logic, for example, is quite complex. And, and, and of course, the load store unit becomes even more complex, right? If you want to do it, let's say, for the entire program, and the entire program has 200,000 instructions. That's a small program, by the way, uh, because this is dynamic instructions we're talking about, right? 200,000 instructions. Then it's going to be uh, quite uh, challenging to really build that inf instruction window, as we discussed last time. And also, you may not need it for the entire 200,000 instructions because your latencies may not be as large, right? But again, if you want to actually think uh, critically and think deeper, maybe your latencies are quite large, actually. If you want to tolerate the latency of an SSD, solid state drive, which is on the order of microseconds uh, today, you may actually uh, need uh, that sort of data flow engine uh, in your system. Think about it. Uh, today's systems actually don't even try to tolerate the uh, access to a solid state drive, right? Whenever a process is executing, uh, when you get a memory access, you don't switch out the process. But when you get a IO access, which goes to the SSD, normally the operating system suspends the process and wakes it up later uh, when the, pro uh, when the uh, result from the IO storage device comes back. Right? But that doesn't have to be uh, the only way of handling IO requests. So, so there is benefit potentially to actually increasing the instruction window uh, to be quite large so that you can tolerate many, many latencies that we have in our system today. Okay, we also discussed, can we do it efficiently with Thomas Sowell's algorithm? Uh, and I already kind of answered that, but you can also uh, look at yesterday's uh, lecture as well. So I recall in the, yesterday's lecture by just looking at, carefully looking at the state of the register alias table uh, and the reservation stations in cycle seven in the machine we simulated, we were able to reverse engineer completely the data flow graph of the machine. And uh, I left it as an exercise to you, but you could actually go from the data flow graph to the sequential instruction order by thinking a little bit more about how the dependencies are, 
uh, and how the uh, values are, etc. But I'm not going to do that uh, at this. Uh, I didn't do that yesterday, but you can also leave it. Uh, you, you can do it as an exercise for yourself. OK, so a data flow. To summarize the data flow paradigm, as we discussed, availability of data determines order of execution. Essentially, there is no centralized control uh, uh, sequencing that happens. There's no program counter, as we discussed earlier. I'm going to say that again. Uh, but basically, at the core of an out of order engine, uh, your, the availability of your source operands determines whether the, uh, the instruction can execute. Uh, and you can think of the instructions as a data flow node, which we did. Uh, and you can look at the slide, for example, the each instruction is a data flow node over here, as you can see, and can figure out what type of instruction it is based on which reservation station it is sitting at, as you can see. And you can reverse engineer the sources, as we have discussed, by, by looking at the tags and uh, how uh, the different tags are linked to different values and reservation stations. Basically, a data flow node, an instruction fires when all of its sources are ready. And programs are represented as data flow graphs of nodes. This is data flow at the ISA level. In the ISA level, you pre represent the programs as data flow graphs. Uh, but Tomaso's algorithm, uh, of course, doesn't do that. Uh, basically, in an out of order machine, we're still obeying the von Neumann model. Programs are represented as sequential flow of instructions, as we have seen. And out of order execution builds this data flow graph. Whereas in a real data flow machine at the ISA level, you actually don't have a sequential notion of execution, as we discussed. right? But uh, we also mentioned that data flow at the ISA level has not been successful. I, I say as over here, but you can, you can safely remove that as. It has not been successful, period, basically. Uh, there are no real machines uh, that, are commercially, that have been commercially successful that had this data flow model at the instruction set architecture level where the programmers needed to program uh, using data flow graphs and compilers needed to compile into data flow graphs, of course, with some instruction specifications, right? Uh, and it has not been successful because basically it required changing all of the software stack uh, and rewriting all of the programs uh, using that new style of execution and new instructions at architecture. And that is a huge effort, of course, right? As you, as you can imagine, right? Because one Neumann model was already uh, quite successful when data flow principles were brought up in 1974 and beyond. And people tried to make data flow quite successful, but the requirement to change the ISA and the entire software stack uh, was too, too much essentially. And also at the same time, people figured out how to employ the data flow principles at the microarchitecture level. This was done in the early 80s, mid, mid 1980s, as we have discussed in the last lecture, while preserving the von Neumann model semantics. So if you can do that, uh, what you're doing is basically say, telling the programmer, programmer, you don't need to change anything. Compilers, none of the software stack needs to change. But I'm going to get some of the benefits of data flow execution, which is uh, independent execution, uh, uh, concurrent execution of independent instructions and latency tolerance benefits. Uh, then it's a very powerful proposition commercially also, right? Because nobody essentially needs to change at the software. You just need to change the microarchitecture. And as a result, this has been extremely successful. And out of word execution is really a prime example of this as we covered it last time. And people have actually uh, uh, tried to make out of order execution even more efficient, which we didn't go into. For example, how do you make tag matching logic more efficient? How do you make renaming more efficient? How do you make... How do you minimize the storage of values? We've discussed that briefly yesterday, but we didn't really go into a whole lot of detail. There are a lot more tricks you can play. How do you minimize the storage for registers? How do you uh, um, make load store handling logic more, even more efficient than what we have discussed last time? So there has been a lot of research plus engineering that has happened over the course of last 30, 35 years uh, since this was first implemented, basically. And th with this, uh, out of our execution was, first commercially successful with Intel Pentium Pro, as we discussed, and essentially all high-performance machines implemented today. OK, recall the slide. This slide uh, may actually resonate better right now. This was from lecture 11 uh, this year uh, in digital design and computer architecture. And I challenged you at that time, asking the question, do we really need to have a program counter in the ISA? And the answer, uh, if you give the answer yes, then you have something like a von Neumann model, right? control-driven sequential execution. And if the answer is no, one potential answer is data-driven parallel execution, and data flow is 
an example of this, the prime example of it, right? And as I mentioned, trade-offs are very high level ones, right? Now, hopefully it's more clear. Basically, ease of programming, is it easier to program in a data flow graph or sequential? And at that time, I think uh, we also discussed it, but uh, many people said uh, it was sequential. Uh, and it's probably hasn't changed that much, but it could be due to the education as well, as we discussed at that time. Uh, certainly, it's good to think about this, right? Uh, ease of compilation. Uh, certainly, we know how to compile code for sequential execution. Do we really know how to compile code for data flow graphs? This is going to be interesting going into the future, I think. Not because data flow is successful at the ISA level, but because data flow paradigm is also becoming more important for reconfigurable architectures. So you're doing FPGA uh, programming in your labs, for example, and you're building a, a von Neumann architecture on top of an FPGA. But another way of taking advantage of FPGAs, as we discussed in an earlier lecture when we discussed the labs, I think that was lecture three, uh, for example, uh, when, uh, is that you take uh, a program and compile a, a portion of its data flow graph on an FPGA and essentially instantiate the data flow graph as execution units and wires that connect those execution units on that FPGA because it's reconfigurable, right? Essentially, if you do that, then you're actually doing data flow execution of a part of a program on the FPGA. And that's extremely fast, of course, as you can imagine. You can also try it actually with the FPGAs you have if you have free time. Uh, that's extremely fast, but of course it requires some sort of either compilation or programming of this data flow graph into the machine. So you need to come up with a data flow graph basically to do that. And of course the efficiency at which you create the data flow graph becomes very important. You can always create a data flow graph, right? The question is how efficient will it be? And performance is uh, something we discussed also. Clearly data flow execution gives you a lot of parallelism, but it comes at the cost of hardware complexity also. And you've seen this uh, in out of order execution, right? Out of order execution is restricted data flow. Clearly it can execute independent instructions uh, very nicely. And it gives you parallelism across those independent instructions, but the hardware complexity compared to uh, the earlier types of machines that we have seen pipelining, for example, really increased significantly. We didn't quantify it and it's not really, really easy to quantify and it's not that important to exactly quantify the hardware complexity. We didn't quantify even performance actually, if you think about it, but people have benchmarked uh, out of order execution performance a lot and their papers written on hardware complexity, but certainly hardware complexity of an out of order execution engine is much higher. But uh, clearly people are building these machines, so it's not impossible, but if you really want to scale up to uh, larger uh, data flow graphs, it's going to be more and more challenging. So this is an exciting time actually, because people are building larger and larger machines uh, today. Uh, and uh, and I, I mentioned uh, Apple M1 is an example uh, of that. And you can, you can find articles on Apple M1's microarchitecture uh, online uh, if you're interested. Okay, so pure data flow. Let's talk about advances and disadvantages of ISA level or pure data flow. Essentially, uh, ISA level data flow is very good at exploiting irregular parallelism. Only real dependencies constrain processing. And you can expose more parallelism at the ISA level than the von Neumann model. And I think this is hopefully obvious. Of course, it comes with a lot of disadvantages at the ISA level. And uh, we've uh, briefly mentioned that when we talk about precise uh, uh, exceptions, but certainly if, you have, if all you have is a data flow graph uh, and no, no ordering between instructions, then you don't have a precise state semantics right, uh, built into your programs. As a result, uh, why you don't have it? Because uh, there's no ordering between instructions, right? Uh, when an instruction faults, you have no idea what part of the data flow graph executed and what part didn't execute. As a result, because you don't have this precise state semantics, debugging data flow machines is extremely difficult. And also on top of this, you don't get the benefits of uh, what precise uh, state semantics and precise exceptions enables, like precise interrupt and exception handling, right? Uh, 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 so basically, because you don't have precise state semantics. So you need to somehow solve these problems. And it's very difficult to solve these problems without giving up from some of the data flow principles, basically. Let me put it that way. I don't want to go into more detail because clearly uh, this is a research problem right now that people are not trying to solve as much. In the past, they were trying to solve, it, uh, solve this a little bit more. So other issues uh, over here include... Uh, let me actually do this over here. Basically, too much parallelism potential. So if you have the entire data flow graph of a, of a program or the system, uh, usually these machines require parallelism control. So this may be a good thing you think. You think that, oh, I'm exploiting a lot of parallelism. But then 
it's it's so much parallelism that uh, you need hardware to actually handle that parallelism, and that requires a lot of tag matching logic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and uh, we're not going to get into that, but this becomes quite expensive. Uh, and as a result, you need high bookkeeping overhead. So you can imagine, you can uh, you can resonate th with this when we talk about the tag matching logic and uh, storage that is needed for values, for example. All of these are uh, done in an out of order processor, but in a data flow processor at the ISA level, it becomes even harder actually, because you need a lot more tag matching, a lot more data storage, and you can even uh, not control the parallels, right? Okay, there's one question. How do we handle conditional statements in a data flow structure? So we covered this, if you remember, there were conditional nodes in a data flow graph uh, and also uh, uh, Boolean uh, nodes that, uh, that generate conditions or predicates, if you will. Uh, if you go to uh, lecture 11, uh, I showed you how to actually do the conditional statements. Uh, so essentially, conditional statements uh, become data uh, statements, data flow graph nodes. Uh, okay, uh, I think there's one more question, which is how does the machine decide which instruction to execute if both become ready in the same cycle, but there's only one available function yet. So we covered this in yesterday's lecture a little bit, but basically uh, there should be a policy. If, if multiple instructions are ready and you don't have enough execution units to actually uh, uh, execute them concurrently, uh, then you need to make a decision. And there, there are hardware arbiters that decide which one to prioritize. Usually oldest first is a safe prioritization mechanism, but people have studied different policies, and I'm not going to go into those policies. OK, too much parallelism, high bookkeeping overhead, high hardware overhead. There are also other issues, like how to enable mutable data structures, data structures th that change a lot, databases, large data structures that you keep writing to. These actually become problems in data flow, because data flow, at its purest sense, don't have the idea of data structures also. So people have tried to incorporate those ideas of data structures, but I'm not going to go into that. And there are a lot of other issues in literature. So if you actually do data flow at the ISA level, you have to handle all of these different issues, as we see over here, and they're not easy. But if you actually do data flow at the microarchitecture level, remember, I actually discussed the slide also uh, in lecture 11. Uh, basically, if you do data flow at the microarchitecture level, you get rid of all of these disadvantages. Actually, essentially, you get rid of all of these disadvantages or actually scale them down to a smaller level. Certainly, you get rid of the precise exception uh, disadvantage. You get rid of the too much parallelism uh, disadvantage. You get rid of high hardware overhead, but the hardware overhead is still uh, large. And you get rid of the how to enable mutable data structures because you're not changing the programming model. Right? If so if you do it at the microarchitecture level without exposing anything to the programmer, then you're golden, if you will, because you actually get some of the benefits of data flow. And that's why out of order execution has been extremely successful as we have mentioned yesterday. So there's one more question. Can we do the branch prediction, value prediction and data flow? That's a great question actually. And uh, people have actually looked at it and uh, people actually uh, uh, figured out that that's a limitation of a data flow engine because you don't have the predicates of conditional nodes ready early on. And people looked at incorporating branch prediction and I believe value prediction also into data flow machines, but there are no machines that are implemented that way. But uh, that's part of the research in data flow, which is not happening a whole lot uh, today, as I mentioned. But that's a very good question. Certainly, you can combine the idea of branch prediction uh, with data flow because you want to get the, uh, uh, if you want to execute some part of your data flow chain faster, quicker, you may want to predict values and predict uh, branches, right? Okay, so this slide, as I said, uh, uh, you can, you can make the trade-off at the microarchitecture level. And as we said in lecture 11, microarchitecture can execute instructions in any order, as long as programmer sees the order specified by the eyes. And that's what the out of order execution is. Okay, so that, uh, I'm not going to talk more about uh, data flow. And there are a lot of good questions and you guys are thinking uh, nicely, I think. You all are thinking nicely. If you're interested in this more, uh, these are some seminal papers on data flow. Uh, it was introduced by uh, Dennis and Misunas in the seminal paper in 1974. And later, there's been a lot of work, a lot of machines built, uh, but I don't have uh, time or, uh, to actually write them on this slide. But if you're really interested, I would recommend watching this lecture, uh, which goes into a lot of detail. For example, you, it goes into detail of how do you do loops and function calls and data flow, which are also interesting because you need to provide mechanisms for doing that in data flow graphs. So you can actually build a full machine uh, as a complete data flow graph, where the operating system and the programs are also integrated with each other through, through uh, special data flow nodes uh, uh, that act as gates, for example. 
But again, uh, that's uh, a completely different lecture that, than uh, what we have time for uh, in this particular class. And I'd recommend you take a look at uh, earlier uh, these lectures if you're really interested in this. OK, so that brings me to the end of data flow and out of order execution. Now let's talk about a completely orthogonal concept, uh, superscalar execution. Mm. And this concept is very easy, actually. Uh, and you, we actually briefly discussed it uh, earlier. Uh, but let me give you the idea. I think uh, the idea is very simple, as I said. You, instead of fetching, decoding, executing, retiring one instruction per cycle, you fetch, decode, execute, retire multiple instructions per cycle. Sounds easy, right? So this is called superscalar because uh, doing uh, fetching, decoding, executing, retiring one instruction per cycle is called scalar execution. You, you operate on a scalar value, if you will, if you stretch the analogy. Superscalar means uh, multiple of these scalar instructions that are executed concurrently, OK? And we're this is still a mo von Neumann model concept, but again, conceptually, it could be applied to other models as well. So n white superscalar means, for example, you fetch, decode, execute, retire, n instructions per cycle. Basically, your pipeline is not one instruction white, but it's actually n instructions white, OK? So it's not, so existing pipelines, actually, existing processors are usually uh, more than four instructions per cycle. They're fetching more than four instructions per cycle. Some of them are fetching eight instructions per cycle. And people are trying to increase it so that you can get more concurrency, for example. So of course, to be able to do this, you need to add the hardware resources for doing so. You need to replicate the pipeline resources so that you can execute, you can fetch, decode, execute, and retire multiple instructions. And on top of this, you need to extend the hardware dependence ch uh, checking logic to concurrently fetch instructions. So if you think about the hardware dependence check checking logic, we have it across different pipeline stages, right? Uh, that's, what, that's what we developed in the pipelining lectures. Now you need to have it within a pipeline stage across different instructions so that the younger instructions that you fetched in the same cycle uh, uh, determine their dependencies correctly because they may be dependent on an instruction that you fetched in the same cycle, right? An earlier instruction. And you need to detect that and you need to ensure that the pipeline works correctly in the presence of multiple instruction fetch. So superscalar execution is also is an example of multiple instruction fetch. Uh, so in order to be able to decode multiple instructions, you need to be able to fetch multiple instructions, right? Uh, certainly, that's how your performance improves. Uh, uh, because if you can fetch only one instruction, you can retire only one instruction, right? That's, uh, that's, that's really important. This is called Flynn's bottleneck, uh, basically. If you want to finish more than one instruction, you need to fetch more than one instruction. Internally, out of order execution, as we discussed last time, executes multiple instructions concurrently, can dispatch multiple instructions concurrently. But the machine we saw was able to fetch only one instruction and retire one instruction. So its cycles per instruction was fundamentally limited to one, uh, one in that case, right? Uh, but, uh, well, instructions per cycle, let's say, because we're talking about throughput, right? Uh, but uh, superscale execution enables instruction per cycle to be greater than one, if you will. But uh, again, you need to pay the hardware cost, as we discussed. Hardware needs to perform dependence checking between concurrently fetched instructions. And if you're doing the superscale execution in an out of order machine, you need to do the renaming concurrently as well. Right? OK, uh, I should mention this because many uh, works, including the paper that I recommended to you to read, uh, confuses, unfortunately, these concepts a little bit in the title, for example, that the paper does. Essentially, superscalar execution and out-of-order execution are completely orthogonal concepts. You can have an out-of-order machine that's scalar. That was the machine we simulated yesterday. right? We were fetching one instruction per cycle. But internally, we had multiple executions. We could execute more than one instruction per cycle. We could complete more than one instruction per cycle. But we could not retire more than one instruction per cycle. But again, you're bottleneck by fetch. If you fetch one instruction per cycle, you cannot retire more than one instruction per cycle unless you're doing some magic in the back end of the pipeline. Uh, so you can have an out of order execution that's superscalar. You can have in order execution that's superscalar also. Right? Basically, you, if, if, if you have two dimensions, in order versus out of order execution, and scalar versus superscalar execution, you can have four combinations, uh, the Cartesian product of these different. Uh, dimensions, essentially. Uh, uh, for example, you can have an in-order scalar machine. We've seen that in the basic pipeline machine. Out-of-order scalar machine. We've seen that in the basic uh, out-of-order machine we studied yesterday. I'm going to show you an in-order superscalar machine right now. And you can imagine an out-of-order superscalar machine easily. And existing processors are all out-of-order, existing high-performance processors are all out-of-order superscalar processors. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the example of in-order superscalar processor from your book, actually. Uh, your book dedicates very little uh, space for superscalar execution, but the conceptually it's easy as you can see. But basically you have multiple copies of the data pack so that you can fetch, decode, execute, retire multiple instructions per cycle. And you can see it here. Basically, uh, you need to widen your instruction memory output so that you can read multiple instructions per cycle. And then you need to have more ports to your register file, or you somehow need to replicate your register file. I'm not going to go into the details of it, uh, so that you can read uh, two source registers per instruction. Here we have two, uh, we can fetch two instructions per cycle. We can decode two instructions per cycle, read in, from the register file two instructions per cycle. You can also see that we can, we're writing to the register file two instructions per cycle. We have two ALUs, as you can see, so that we can execute two instructions per cycle. And then, uh, if two instructions happen to be memory accesses, you need to have two read ports to the memory or two write ports to the memory so that you can read uh, two instructions per cycle and write two instructions per cycle into memory, load, loads and stores essentially, right? And eventually the write backstage also can, should handle, should be able to handle two instructions per cycle as you can see, as we briefly mentioned. So basically you need to replicate your resources so that you can handle two instructions per cycle, but that's not enough. Uh, here, ideal IPC is two, of course, right, in this case. So basically, you've doubled your IPC ideally. If these instructions are completely independent of each other, that's great. By not necessarily fully doubling the resources, you're getting double the performance, potentially. Well, performance is a different issue. You're doubling the IPC instructions per cycle. We will see about performance in a little bit, actually. But dependencies make it tricky, of course, right? to dispatch multiple instructions in the same cycle. Basically, after you figure out which registers each instruction is sourcing, you need to check whether the older, uh, younger instruction is sourcing a register written by the older instruction. And load store dependencies also become problematic, right? You may have a store in, uh, as the second instruction, younger instruction, and a load, well, the other way around. You may have a load as the younger instruction. You may have a store as the older instruction, and they may have the same address, but you don't know it until you compute both of their addresses. So you need to be able to check uh, the dependencies of multiple instructions that are concurrently fetched in the same cycle, in addition to checking the dependencies of the instruction that you're uh, decoding with all other instructions that are already in the pipeline. So basically, uh, this uh, makes uh, your dependency checking logic, logic more complex, as we have discussed. And you can imagine, if you have a 16 wide fetch engine, uh, if you can fetch 16 instructions, then every single instruction uh, should really check the dependencies, uh, uh, should really check if it's really sourcing a register uh, that is written by an earlier instruction within that 16 instruction bundle, if you will. And that makes the dependency checking logic actually look like kind of a tree, if you will. Uh, you can imagine that. I'm not going to go into the details of it. But fundamentally, it's no different from checking the dependencies between different pipeline stages, except you're doing it concurrently right now. But the downside is if you do it concurrently, it may impact your cycle time, right? Okay, well, even the earlier dependency checking could impact your cycle time as we discussed. Okay, so let's take a look at the performance of an in-order superscalar machine that I showed you earlier uh, in this slide. Uh, if you look at this code, all of the instructions are independent of each other, which is great. As a result, you get the ideal IPC. You can issue six instructions in three cycles in this particular case over here. So that's good. That's, uh, that's how uh, things work. Uh, that, that, that's how you get the performance. From. So there's one question. This is essentially multi-threading, right? No, uh, this is different from multi-threading. Here, you're fetching from the same thread. So this is the same thread of execution, you can see. This is the same program, basically. Multi-threading, you're fetching from different threads every cycle. So uh, you could have a superscalar machine where you're fetching from uh, where the instructions that you fetch uh, in the same cycle are from different threads. So certainly you can combine the idea of superscalar with multi-threading, but that's not what I did over here. Basically, I'm fetching PC, instruction at PC over here, and the instruction at PC plus four. So I'm fetching two consecutive instructions from uh, the same program, okay? But good question in the sense that you can combine those concepts also. You can have superscalar processor where each instruction that is, uh, is, is fetched from different threads. But superscalar normally refers to a single program and you fetch multiple instructions in the same cycle from that program. Okay, so this is an e easy and nice example, beautiful example, if you will, where uh, 
the instructions happen to be independent of each other. As a result, uh, there are no dependencies between concurrently fetched instructions. As a result, you get the full throughput of a superscalar machine, two instructions per cycle. And that's great. You've doubled the performance, hopefully, assuming you didn't do anything badly to your clock cycle time by building this superscalar processor. Now, how do you get this? Of course, your compiler can be intelligent, right? If you have an in-order superscalar machine, your compiler can, again, reorder the instructions such that uh, any two consecutive instructions are independent of each other. Right? If you can do that, again, your, uh, your compiler has provided you two independent instructions. And this is one place where compilers can be very useful. Even in out of order superscalar machines, compilers can be useful by packing uh, independent instructions uh, so that they can be fetched concurrently and they can be dispatched concurrently into the machine. OK, life is not always this beautiful, as we have discussed with pipelining. That's true for superscalar performance also. Let's take a look at this particular program. Here you can see that load word is loading T0 and add is sourcing T0. Too bad. These two instructions are dependent. Well, add is dependent on load word. And that's true for sub also. Uh, this end is dependent on sub. And that's true for uh, this or and store word also, as you can see. Now, because this happens, we've lost one slot, if you will. Uh, we could dispatch load word over here, but we cannot dispatch the next add. As a result, uh, we're not utilizing the superscalar white pipeline nicely. As a result, the instruction per cycle actually goes down to 1.2. We're issuing six instructions in five cycles over here. Of course, it's a cooked up, a cooked up example. Uh, but now you can potentially see uh, how the compiler can do the reordering. Right? Potentially, the compiler can take the sub instruction and reorder it over here. And take this OR instruction and reorder it over here. And if it does that, then you're back to being golden, if you will. I didn't really verify it exactly, but I believe I didn't violate any dependencies by doing that. You take the sub instruction, reorder it before the add, and you take this, uh, well, that may not work because you have the T0 over here. So you need to rename T0 also. There you go. So basically, the, you were running issues with compiler reordering. Maybe you cannot do it just by looking at this piece of code. You may need to look at later parts of the code to actually do that reordering. But if the compiler can actually put instructions over here that are independent, you can get back to ideal IPC, assuming the compiler is uh, able to do that, of course, right? OK, uh, so what happens if concurrently fetched instructions write to the same register in a superscalar machine? Can it remember which was first? Yes, you, need, you do need to remember, right? Again, uh, because of the sequential semantics of the von Neumann model, you cannot write uh, to the same register in an out of order manner. You need to obey that false dependency. Even though it's a false dependency, you still need to obey it due to sequential execution semantics. Because uh, what might happen, as you know, is an exception, right? And in an exceptional condition, you really want to be able to figure out what was going on. So yes, the superscalar machine needs to deal with those dependencies as well, just like a pipeline machine does. But superscalar, things become a little bit more complicated. So that's a very good question, actually. OK, uh, OK. Um, OK, review. Uh, remember that uh, we discussed many ways of handling data dependencies in earlier lectures. And all of these are actually applicable to superscalar machines as well. Right? I'm not going to go into it. Certainly, you can do fine grained multi threading, as we discussed. You can do value prediction. You can do out of order execution plus superscalar. You can try to detect and eliminate the dependence at the software level. Like we discussed, software can do scheduling. And you, it, at the very basics, you need to detect and wait. Uh, or the software ensures that. Uh, you, you never need to stall by inserting no ops, for example, right? as we discussed. And you still can have forwarding bypassing as well within concurrent instructions. But uh, that's not easy to do, as you can imagine. So certainly, all of these are applicable to superscalar machines as well. So that's why they're fundamental. So let's discuss the trade-offs of superscalar execution uh, before we conclude this part of the lecture. Certainly, a big advantage, uh, the, the main reason why we're doing this is we, we want to get higher concurrence, higher instruction throughput and essentially higher IPC, instructions per cycle. Instructions per cycle is the inverse of CPI, which we're trying to reduce, as you remember, right? As, we, as I will show you in a little bit. Basically, lower CPI is good. So execution time of an entire program is number of instructions times the average CPI times the clock cycle time. Basically, we're reducing the average CPI, hopefully, uh, by doing super scare execution. We're not changing the number of instructions because the same instruction stream is executing. Assume that the compiler produces the same instruction stream. And that's the idea in superscalar execution as much as possible. Then the question becomes, are we changing the clock cycle time? Right? If we're not changing the clock cycle time, that's good always. right? We're reducing the CPI 
and we should be improving performance. But possibly we may be changing the clock cycle time because of some of these disadvantages over here, which we've already discussed actually. Essentially, you have higher complexity for dependence checking right now. It requires checking within a pipeline stage, which was not required in any of the machines that we discussed earlier. And register renaming becomes more complex in an out of order processor, especially if you want to build a wide super scale range, eight wide, let's say, eight instructions per cycle. And in many machines today, you can fetch eight instructions per cycle, decode eight instructions per cycle, and rename eight instructions per cycle. But you need to check dependencies uh, within, those, uh, within that bundle of eight instructions. And you need to do the renaming also concurrently at the same time. Because if you remember, we discussed renaming yesterday for a scalar machine. And whenever you do renaming, you need to read your sources from the register alias table. Uh, and then you need to also uh, uh, write uh, to your destination register the new name, meaning the reservation station ID or the reorder buffer ID, or essentially the physical register ID. Right? Basically, you need to be able to do that for all eight instructions concurrently while obeying the dependencies between those eight instructions. So this becomes a sequential process, right? Because a later instruction, let's say uh, you're fetching instructions zero through seven. Instruction seven can be dependent on six. Instruction six can be dependent on instruction five. Instruction five can be dependent on instruction four. Instruction four can be dependent on instruction three, which can be dependent on instruction two, which can be dependent on instruction one, which can be dependent on instruction zero. Now, if all of them are dependent, then you need to propagate the correct uh, names or tags to each of those instructions through a serial dependence chain. And you need to do that within a cycle, or at least concurrently. Again, you don't necessarily need to do it within a cycle. You can break that pipeline stage into many cycles, right? But that increases the depth of your pipeline and hence your branch misprediction penalty, which is important as we will see in the next lecture. So basically this becomes complicated and it can potentially increase your clock cycle time if you're not able to break uh, the, uh, this dependence checking logic into multiple pipeline stages successfully. If you do break it into multiple pipeline stages, then it can affect your instruction throughput worse, right? Basically, you increase your instruction throughput by uh, adding superscale execution. But dependency checking within a single cycle was not good for clock cycle time. So you did it in multiple clock cycles, which means that you increase the depth of your pipeline. Whenever you increase the depth of your pipeline, your CPI cycles per instruction gets impacted negatively, meaning it increases because of branch misprediction delay that increases. And also because now you need to keep the pipeline full, right? The deeper your pipeline is, the more difficult to keep pipeline full because you have data dependencies. Okay, so you can see that there's complicated trade-offs once you go into uh, multiple instruction fetch pipeline machines. And also register renaming is not easy. Okay, uh, and, and clearly, as I said, this potentially lengthens the critical path delay and clock cycle time. So uh, disadvantage can actually reduce the performance uh, gains that are achieved uh, by increasing the instruction throughput. Okay, and of course, uh, obviously more hardware resources are needed. You need to replicate the pipeline, at least parts of it, so that you can fetch, decode, execute, uh, and retire multiple instructions per cycle. Okay, so that brings us uh, nicely to the end of lecture 17a. And uh, unless there are burning questions, it's a really good time to take a break. And I will take a break for 10 minutes. We can be back at 15.10. And then we will continue or we will start uh, the branch prediction uh, lecture. Okay, is there a question? Feel free to write. Uh, I don't see it. Okay, maybe we'll take the break and feel free to write it over the break uh, and then we can handle it when we come back from the break. <laughs> 